So some fundamental principles of realist methodology. So the first principle is that realist methodology is pragmatic. So in other words, understanding how programs work is the basis for determining how to refine, improve, innovate, or maybe even cancel initiatives. So I say this because realist methodology has not been developed as a form of basic research. It is highly pragmatic. It is specialized with the idea that we are struggling to resolve complex problems um, and some problems are very difficult to resolve and are very complex. And then on top of that, the interventions we develop are complex. So all of this work in evaluating interventions has to have some pragmatic goal. And so it, the, the other point I want to make about the pragmatic nature of realist evaluation is that we are cutting through the complexity uh, of, of interventions and their contexts to find the most important aspects of that complexity to study at a given time. Um, for the purposes of the evaluation of an intervention today, what are the most important things that we need to understand about the architecture of the intervention and its implementation in context? And we may not be able to analyze the entirety of that complexity, uh, but maybe that's not necessary. We need to prioritize and find a way to cut through that complexity. So that pragmatic focus is absolutely central. So in so much of the work I do, working with clients in consultation, uh, it's about helping people dis come to decisions around the design of their realist evaluation or the realist synthesis around those pragmatic goals. The second point here is that realist methodology is retroductive. So in other words, understanding how programs work requires an investigation into the manifestation of underlying causal forces that generate outcomes. So when I say retroductive, retroductive means understanding why things are the way they are. What is the underlying reason for uh, outcomes to have manifested or outcomes to not have manifested? There is some underpinning or underlying reason and that is the mechanism and that is about that is what i mean when when i use the term retroductive so uh, this is absolutely central if you are designing a realist project but you're not trying to uncover the underlying factors the underlying forces that serve to explain why or how or for whom in which context the program is working then you're not really optimizing the realist paradigm. You're not using realism as it should be used. Um, so here, it's a very central question. Why is this happening? Not just that it works, you know, because a lot of empirical research um, is addressing the question, does the intervention work? Does it work or doesn't it work? Um, that is not a realist question. A realist question is, how does it work? Why is it working? Why is it not working? And for the final point on this slide, realist methodology is evidence informed. This means that retroductive program theories are tested against the best available evidence, but in the end, we produce evidence informed theories. We're not producing facts. We're not producing definitive answers to anything. We are scrutinizing our best thinking, our best retroductive thinking. We are scrutinizing that against the best available evidence. Now, what constitutes best available evidence? It's a very good question. Uh, and maybe if you have want to discuss that, we can go into that a bit in the discussion. It's a bit beyond the scope uh, for me to get into that. It's a very interesting conversation to have. But the point is that realist methodology is not strictly evidence-based. We're not in a paradigm where we say, just let the evidence speak for itself. Because so much of causation, so much of what is causing things to happen is beyond evidence capture. It's very difficult to capture the underpinning mechanisms of interventions that explain how things work through empirical measurement. 
Um, and so that's when we introduce theory. So theory helps us fill in those gaps and we do our best to evidence that theory, but we may not always be successful. That's not a failure. That is being realistic about what is achievable when you try to uncover generative causation. So there you understand the word, even the word realist, realistic is a, a, the methodology of realism is to become more realistic about what is achievable in a research process. That's one way of, of defining the term realist. Um, okay. And so now I'm going to just talk about the context mechanism outcome configuration. And essentially, I'm going to give you a very simple definition for each of context, mechanism, and outcome. Uh, it, there's more to be said about this. It's, we can go into much more detail, but very simply, you might say that context has to do with the causally important aspects, causally important aspects of the backdrop environment of programs. In other words, those aspects of an intervention's environment that have an impact on why a program is working or not. There are many aspects to context that are not necessarily causally related to the outcomes of interventions, or they are very weakly related, but there are some aspects of context that are very critical, absolutely critical for the functioning of interventions. So in a realist analysis, we want to harness those key pieces of context that are absolutely critical in understanding how a program is working. But context is different from mechanism in the sense that the mechanism is the material and social resources of a program and how stake and stakeholder responses to such resources. This is the, uh, see if I, I can actually underline, it's material and social resources and stakeholder responses. So resource and response are actually the key words here that um, a mechanism is the underpinning resources. And when I say social resource, it may be an opportunity to create a, a culturally safe environment, for example, or respect or trust or empathy. That's like a, a social resource. It may be emotional resource. Material resources may be physical, technology, it could be financial, monetary. Uh, etc. Now, this is also very thin, a very thin description. We could explode this idea and get in much more detail about all the different ways that an architecture of a program can provide resources. But the key here is that mechanism is about the architecture of the program. Context is about the backdrop, the environment upon which the program is implemented. So one of the tasks early on in any realist evaluation or synthesis should be, in my opinion, should be to sketch out what is the architecture of this program in relation to its environment. It sometimes is not entirely clear. Uh, and this is where we can continue to clarify and have discussion. Sometimes it's not entirely clear. There is some blurring between the mechanism and the context, but that activity alone, understanding the mechanisms and the context is a very, very useful activity. And finally, outcome we may describe as measurable or descriptive impacts. So here could be behavioral um, uh, measures, or uh, so it could be qualitative or quantitative, uh, measurable or descriptive at the behavioral level. So how people are changed, have they changed their behavior? Have people been asked to do something differently and have they actually changed their behavior? Um, clinical, so it could be, say, body mass index or some blood test or something at the biophysiological level. It could be at the level of epidemiology, so the outcomes could be tracking rates of infection, for example. But all of that is um, measurable and describable. When you go back to mechanism as how people respond to resources, how people respond, stakeholder responses, yeah, stakeholder responses to resources. What, what realist methodology is saying, what Poston and Tilly have said, is that it's really the, the linchpin to understanding how programs work is how people respond to resources offered in programs. Okay, 
So, Vibhav, is everything going okay with the technology? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, so I'll just move on. So this is the context mechanism outcome configuration. Now I'm adding a layer here, a little more complexity to the context mechanism outcome configuration. But still, it's still the definition is the same. You have context, right? So here you have context. And um, here is the mechanism. So the mechanism is the resource and response. And here is the outcome, right? There's the CMO. Now, what we may say is that when you have a policy initiative, uh, so you have a policy that is providing direction, providing um, some kind of uh, uh, action, implementable action, what that happens is it produces resources. Sometimes those resources are very clearly spelled out in the blueprints of that architecture. So the policymaker, like say the politician or the policymaker, the health officers, or the community leader or whoever it is may be very clearly saying these are going to be the resources of this policy initiative uh, and here we will provide them for you. In other cases, the resources are not so clear uh, or there is a mix of clarity and, un and a lack of clarity around what the resources of the policy initiative are. But in any case, you have the idea is that the policy initiative creates resources and those resources will trigger a response in people. People will like those resources. People will dislike them. People will trust them. Maybe they have a mistrust of those resources or they have a fear of apprehension, a fear of consequence. So they uptake those resources or they feel incentivized uh, through being rewarded. So there's so many ways in which resources will impact on responses but this is how we understand the mechanism. Now, interesting though, that the response is not just influenced by the resource, it is also influenced by the context. Uh, in other words, yes, you have some resources, maybe you have a resource to incentivize a certain way of, new way of thinking. Maybe you offer some, some, some offer, something is on offer, some monetary offer or some other kind of support and you expect that the response will be positive. But in your evaluation, when you find that the response is not positive, then the question is, what happened? Why is it? Then in investigation, you might find out that the, the context has something in the context that is impeding the resource from activating the response. So the mechanism doesn't get triggered because the context is uh, not fertile. The context doesn't have the right enablers to trigger the mechanism. So this is the way we talk in the realist language. Now, all of you must be working on some projects. So you already you can start to think about how you can apply this framework to your work. Um, and then it becomes a very interesting uh, endeavor. So then you have uh, mechanisms. The idea is that if everything is going well, you will have a policy initiative. It triggers the resource and the context is supportive of this resource leading to the, re to the response, which is a feeling of maybe motivation and appreciation or recognition of the efforts and agreement with the efforts. And then that leads to the outcome, the desired outcome of the behavior change that was the or origin for the, um, like the desired origin for the policy initiative. So that's generally how we lay out the realist analysis. And using this, we can then see where something, if it goes wrong, where it went wrong, or if it fails, why did it fail? Is it because the resource is not sound? It's not the right, it's just not a good resource, or is it because the context is, uh, has too much hardship in the context? Uh, or is sometimes outcomes are not clearly conceptualized either. So there are so many things that can be revealed through a realist uh, project. Uh, so again, we can, you know, discuss. Let me give you an example. Okay, so here's an example of a context mechanism outcome configuration. And the example I use here is say you have a public health campaign to promote hand washing in the food services industry. It's hypothetical. I just, hypothetical, it could be any industry. It could be promote hand washing in the hospital sector. Or it could be anything. But just for the for this purposes, I just decided to say, let's say the restaurant business and 
catering business food service industry so so say there's a campaign so then first of all if you say there's a campaign so the campaign is the architecture right this is the effort so remember when i said that the effort the architecture has to do with the mechanism so here i have the c m and o the c is in red the m is in green and the o is in white but there's no reason for that color i'm not trying to give you any extra meaning about the color decision i just wanted to separate out the three uh, elements of the cmo configuration and so the campaign the, so the mechanism we can look at the mechanism what is written here information and guidance okay so that's the resource those are two resources there is information about the problem with not hand washing and there is guidance on how to do hand washing so resources now still not enough detail here because you might say what what was the medium how was it delivered so that's another aspect of the resource was it delivered by a pamphlet was it delivered through radio was it delivered through social media etc but the idea is that the resources are the uh, uh, aspects of the architecture of the program that are on offer and then how people respond so the response part of the mechanism is the degree of uptake interest motivation you know do people agree yes i agree this is a good idea yes i will i will do hand washing i i, I realize there's a problem we should do better we should try or is it like something completely different i don't care this is just another tactic this is another surveillance tactic somebody is trying to control me um you know or is it something else it could be so many different ways in which people reason in relation to the resources of, of programs and the context. So here is the outcome. Sorry, let's go to context. So the context here could be uh, the availability of sanitation supplies, clean water, trust in public officials, or a viral outbreak. So these are all different examples of context. Now, why I say that is why this is context is because in this particular example, the architecture of the program was that it was giving information and guidance, but it didn't give anything beyond a public service announcement type of guidance. Uh, and so what is left in the, in the implementation context is the question, well, if people are told that they need to use uh, a certain kind of soap, for example, is there, avail is there an availability of that in the context? Uh, is there clean water? because how can you continue doing hand washing without clean water? Also, is there a pre-existing trust in public officials? If the public official has sent this message, is there pre-existing trust um, uh, in that official? Because if there's not, that might explain why, despite accurate information and very clear guidance, why there is less uptake. So all of these aspects of context, uh, and the fourth one, viral outbreak, you might say that in times of viral outbreak, the context becomes very much aligned with the mechanism of, say, information and guidance. And the response, the degree of uptake and interest, uh, is in part due to the information and guidance, but also due to the uh, uh, viral outbreak that has happened in the context. So this is how we can explain why programs are working, why they're working very well, or why they're working poorly, is the combination, the interaction between context and mechanism. So for here, outcome is the frequency and quality of hand washing activity as an example. So I don't know if you can, if that's realistic to measure that, but that's, you see it's at the behavioral level, um, uh, it could be quantitative data. It could be qualitative data. So quantitative, you count how many times the person has, you know, the organization has, uh, or or it, have they raised the standards of hand washing so that the actual act of doing such a thing is increased in quality. So all of those things, and the other types of outcomes, for example, frequency of new outbreaks or hospitalization numbers. So you may understand how outcomes are really sort of those larger outcomes. They're often the outcomes of interest, um, but they may also be surprising outcomes, unintended outcomes. So I have an ex I'll show you, I'm sticking with this example, but I'm going to expand it a bit, okay? 
So hang on to your questions. I know I, I may be going a bit fast. I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, hang on to your questions. You know, write them in the chat box uh, as as they come into your mind, and uh, hopefully we will uh, address them. Okay, so um, now I want to just talk, explain to you a bit more about the architectural understanding, the architectural understanding of public health initiatives. So there is always an architecture to programs. All actions and efforts of an initiative constitutes a program's architecture. We can say that any time you do any effort, that you can theorize that effort. What is the intention? What is the resource here? Is it communication? Is it an authoritative leader? What, what is the resources of that? So that is the architecture. Now, some aspects of program architecture are easy to identify, whether, whereas other aspects are not so obvious. And this is where doing this exercise in the start of your realist project is very valuable because you might start with the formal architecture, sort of what people kind of immediately think of in terms of the design of such an in initiative. But upon closer look, you realize that actually there is a deeper architecture happening that is not so immediately apparent. Um, and I'll show you an example. And the third point is there's always a context of implementation. So all actions and efforts manifest in an environment. Some aspects of the environment have more causal impact than others. And context is always changing. So it's very dynamic process to do an analysis of um, uh, realist analysis using CMO configuration. And uh, our current times is a brilliant example of that, of how even midway through an evaluation, the context may change drastically, which alters the resources of an intervention, maybe cancels the intervention, but maybe alters it, maybe augments it. And then this serves to explain how it's working, why it's working. Okay, so we have to understand that um, all efforts can be theorized using realist program theory, and this can form the basis of our architectural understanding of initiatives. So when you break it down, you know, when you look at the mechanism, the mechanism resources and possible mechanism responses, in the case of the hand washing in it, initiative so there could be information so very just in just detail information about the risks of not doing and um, why you should there could be instructions so how to do but then also things like the authority of the messenger so is it the health authority is it the local leader the national leader who is saying these words and this is triggering the response uh, could be a feeling of motivation due to trust in the messenger or maybe a distrust, so the opposite effect could be happening. Um, so it could also be the medium of the message. So if it's being delivered through the uh, radio um, or say through the television, then who, who is not being reached? So we can understand this as uh, specific to certain people, but then the mechanism doesn't trigger if the, if the context, the infrastructure, uh, through which the message is being delivered does, is not there for some people. Um, so the medium of the message is important and the frequency of the message. So maybe it has to be uh, uh, said more than once for the reasoning of the end user, the stakeholder to activate, that needs to happen. And possible mechanism response, uh, is it feeling threatened by consequence? You know, I will I will, there will be some consequence to my not doing uh, or enthusiasm due to incentivization. You know, if I do this, I will receive some, something good will come, monetary or some, you know, status, something good. Enthusiasm due to the context. So in the case of an outbreak, um, you feel very motivated to uptake the intervention out of a fear of consequence or so enthusiasm, but really because of uh, difficulties in the context. Motivation could be due to trust in the messenger or even maybe a frustration due to lack of customization. So there's so many ways in which mechanisms, uh, people may res be responding to resources. But this is just to give you a, a, like an idea. I know that for many people, your interventions are quite complex. Uh, I just start with a simple exercise here, a simple idea to see if you can all sort of come to the same page about what we talk about. 
CMO. So when I say talk about the public health campaign architecture, you're taking this hand washing, for example. And remember, I just said that sometimes we think of an architecture as fairly straightforward, but then on closer inspection, you realize that there is a more hidden architecture that's going on. It just may not be so easily revealed on first, you know, first thought. So this idea that say you have a campaign or you have a health official who has declared that you know you must uh, follow these guidelines um, and and wash your hands. Uh, so say you have this architecture, you have the message from the public health authority, then you have the content of the message, the medium of the message. Those are two important aspects of the architecture. But what actually happens, the way it works is that there are at the community level, early adopters of this. Not everybody adopts the intervention. There are key people in the community who listen to this message and say, oh yes, we must follow these directives. They become early adopters and they become these natural champions. And so what happens is they may end up re-messaging. So the, the initial message gets re-messaged through the community adopters and they also conduct natural surveillance. So natural surveillance is they start to surveil other people in their community to see if they are following the guidelines or not. This is not, they're not getting paid to do so. They're, this is not even thought about in the minds of the policy architects. It's a natural outflow of the implementation. It just happens naturally. Um, and sometimes we miss this. So realist methodology helps us try to, we, we strive to capture that realistic view of how interventions unfold. Um, and so then you have outcomes, hand washing, you may have uh, other uh, unanticipated outcomes. Um, so you see that, you know, there's a bit of an implementation chain here, right? So it's, in, in a way it sort of kind of happens in that way that uh, there's a pathway to outcomes and along the pathway there are CMO configurations you know so we can see that so there's a CM, you might have CMO configurations at the level of the public health authority what is the reasoning how do how do they respond maybe the resource they receive is epidemiological data and from that data they put together a public uh, service announcement so in their motivation to do so, their intention to do so, there's a CMO. And then there's the medium of the message. So the mechanism has to do with the, the nature of the medium. Is it a brochure? Is it a pamphlet? But then can people read? So in the context of illiteracy, the mechanism of a written document may not trigger and leading to poor outcomes. The content of the message. So you have to study like what is actually being said? Is it is it sound advice? Does it make sense? Is it something contradictory, um, lacking in uh, sensitivity to local context? Uh, and then you have early level adopters. So there are mechanisms here. So there's context. There's something about the context of the early adopters that we need to study. And their mechanism is really like their enthusiasm. What made them so enthusiastic early on? And so you have CMOs at all these stages re-messaging natural surveillance is to give you an idea that the CMO configuration, even though it might have an overarching, it might help you um, uh, come up with an overarching conceptualization. At the same time, when you do data collection and analysis, you might have very finite, very granulated CMO configurations that fit under each of the components of the architecture of the program. Um, that serve to explain the program. And it's interesting, you know, if something fails, then if you spell all of this out, you might be able to trace it back to a weak link. Where is the weak link here? What has happened? Is it the case during natural surveillance that there starts to become conflict in communities? Some people are surveilling other people, but those other people are not wanting to be surveilled. And that creates a, a, a new outcome of some kind of uh, uh, conflict in communities. So like that, we can break it down and try to understand all the intended and unintended impacts of uh, programs. Okay, so another architecture, this is a second example. Now, interesting, I'm showing you the same policy, same type of policy can have a very different architectural design. In this case, you start with this nationwide training of public health inspectors. 
and they get trained to teach to inspect to teach and inspect people how to uh, do hand washing in the food service industry. In addition, there is some public messaging to make sure that people are aware that there are now inspectors who are going to come into your neighborhoods and do random inspections of your restaurants and um, catering services and uh, uh, maybe even uh, food factories or I don't know. And so then, so then what happens is they get deployed to the sites. Um, and the ar architecture here is that there are fines for non-compliance. So they get, they drop in and they see, well, let's look at the washing station. Is it set up properly as it was directed into the, uh, with the guidelines, is the pro proper uh, soap being used, et cetera, et cetera. So there may be fines for non-compliance. So they have to pay a fine alternatively, or in, the in addition, there may be some incentives for compliance. You may be put on a list of, uh, you know, gold star um, rated uh, restaurants or something. So there's some incentivization. All of those details matter because they affect the reasoning of the stakeholders involved in how things play out. So again, you have these CMO configurations that may, you know, pertain to, you know, may pertain to the overall um, uh, architecture, but may also pertain to each of these individual components. And dissecting it down in that way is, really the direction that most people go when they do a realist uh, project. Um, and that way you can really make sense of how everything is working, how it's working together. And like I say, where the weak spots are. So then you may have say training outcomes from the training component, but then you have other outcomes having to do with hand washing and you might have some other anticipated outcomes as well. Okay. So uh, for example, now say I add a, a, a new layer. So this is just the architecture of the program. But now I may add a new layer that in the context of resource poverty, okay, so now you have a new context there. Same architecture, but in the context of resource poverty, uh, you may say that he here's, a, here's a CMO configuration. In regions of resource poverty, inspectors learn about the lack of resources lack of clean water for people to uptake intervention mechanisms. So they go to some areas in the neighborhood or some towns where there's no running water. And uh, how can somebody engage in the intervention? And it doesn't seem fair to find them if they cannot even have the basic uh, prerequisites for the intervention. So there might be an unanticipated outcome. Maybe the inspectors lobby local government to provide new, provide needed supplies and from there comes new grassroots advocacy. Uh, some new relationship has been built between the inspectors and the, the local people. Uh, and some new grassroots advocacy, maybe some it has started a new movement to make sure that uh, people who are in the resource poverty um, situation are able to uh, meet the demands of these policy initiatives. So like that, we can open up our analysis and see it's not just a linear, you know, did it work or not work, but what were all the components? Um, how, what were all those resources, formal resources and hidden resources? How did people respond to those resources? And what were the outcomes? So in the case, in this last case that I said, we're talking about inspectors, so you might say that the mechanism response has to do with the inspectors, not the end users, not the local restaurant owners example, but the inspectors have a reasoning. They reason, they have a realization that something is not right. There's a lack of customization of the policy to certain populations and that this may need to be corrected. So the point I'm making is that it's very interesting to do a realist project a realist study of a policy because upon implementation of a policy when there are deficits in the context it may be the case that new initiatives arrive arise new innovations arise or there is new conflict that arises that ends up creating new harms and so here is a way to really map out that architecture and try to get to the underlying forces um, the underlying mechanisms of how it works. So I just say that, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's probably right time, right? So it's my concluding points. I have two slides. 
So the first um, point is that realist methodology is a theory-driven approach to evaluating programs. So theory is about causation. Theory is all about why is this working? What is, and not just overall, but the different components of the architecture of interventions, what contribution are they making? How is this component working in relation to the overall program? And that is where the theory comes into play. Um, the second point is realist program theories have to do with the causal aspects of a program's architecture as it interacts in context. So this is the central, central, central word here is the causal aspects. So if your program theories are not causal in nature, then you need to rethink them uh, and find the causal connection, the underpinning causal connection of how things are working. And as Pawson and Tilly have described, this is about how people respond or how people reason to resources on offer, okay? And the third point in this slide is that understanding the basic architecture of programs including the formal and the hidden resources is an important starting activity in any realist project. If you don't do that, then you will inevitably get very confused halfway through your analysis about what you're calling context and what you're calling mechanism. And this is what I see happening to many, many projects is that there is not a clarity about the difference between context and mechanism. This is absolutely essential to pin down because even once you clarify it, there will still be some points of muddiness, confusion, or overlap. And so you want to minimize that. You won't fully eradicate that. You want to minimize it. And so thinking about the architecture in relation to the environment of the implementation of that architecture, that is a very, very good starting point for your Realist project. And just three more points, and then we can turn it to questions. So a program's architecture can be explicated through a set of Realist program theories that hypothesize how an initiative interacts in context to produce outcomes. Sometimes it's all about the context. Really, your analysis becomes very context heavy because there are certain aspects of the context that are incredibly favorable or incredibly unfavorable to the intervention. So the next point is that in the process of testing Realist program theories and data collection and analysis, new aspects of the context and implementation chain may be revealed. So even though in the start of your project, you start with some theoretical understanding, you develop your best thinking, your retroductive thinking around the theories of how it works. But then once you go into the field, you do data collection, you will inevitably find that even though some of those theories will get confirmed, we often find that the data allows us to go much deeper into understanding the architecture, the formal and informal architecture, and the causal nature of that architecture. So it becomes a very rich, very informative, very interesting experience to do that, and hopefully very useful experience as well. The final point is that the outputs of a realist analysis should present these details as evidence-informed theories about the program for pragmatic goals, including future innovation. So for example, in the case of the hand-washing intervention, if through your realist evaluation, it became clear that um, there are certain uh, sectors, certain people that are not even eligible for this intervention because they don't have the basic prerequisites in the context, then future iterations of the program should provide such resources for those areas to improve the customization of the policy. Otherwise, we keep starting at square one and we keep seeing interventions fail over and over and over. And the question is, when, when will we ever learn? When will we become more sophisticated in our thinking to have foresight to anticipate that how an intervention will play out in different contexts? So the realist approach is a cumulative a uh, theory building, theory testing approach where we try to develop this retroductive capacity over time to develop the kind of foresight to be able to see how things will unfold, provide provisions, continue to monitor and evaluate, and hopefully optimize the opportunity we have to implement um, programs and policies.
So that concludes my formal presentation. Um, I have just put up my email, my website, and there's a publication. Some people may have seen this already from 2019, Realist Synthesis for Public Health. Um, so you may feel free to uh, access, that, access that for more information. So Vaibhav, shall we turn it over to questions? Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for the smooth and insightful presentation. I'll uh, open it up for the questions now. To start, uh, we can take a few questions that have already been shared in the chat box. Uh, first question was shared by Meena. Uh, she asked this, uh, why uh, factors such as availability of supplies uh, or trust uh, are put under context instead of mechanism? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, you're asking the right kinds of questions. Um, so, and the answer is that it depends because say the availability of supplies, if this is not part of the architecture of the intervention, say in 2020, in the year 2020, somebody designs an intervention that is a public health campaign, but, in a, but there is no additional resources beyond uh, the information, then anything outside of that that is required for the intervention to function is context. Alternatively, if in 2020 or in the next decade, we develop an intervention that is a public health campaign. And in addition to the information, we provide supplies as part of the intervention, then those supplies absolutely will become the resource of the intervention. But in the current iteration, those those supplies are, re are actually part of the context because then you can analyze that in some contexts that have those resources, the intervention is working. Whereas in other contexts that lack those supplies, the intervention doesn't work. And so it's a context difference. So feel free to ask again if that doesn't make sense or you want to ask further. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I'll take up next question now. Uh, Sukanya, one of the participant, uh, has asked you to explain a bit on uh, the re reproductive nature of the realist evolution. And uh, mm -hmm. Prakriti has, uh, has the same question and she adds to it that um, if you can explain it through an example, that will be very helpful. Yeah, retroduction. Retroduction is simply asking the why question or the how question. So, for example, say you, you, you so let's take this example of the hand washing intervention. I know it's a fairly straightforward example. I know that people have more complex interventions, but it's a good way to talk through some of these ideas. Say you do an evaluation of this hand washing intervention. So you go to site A, you say you have 10 sites and they're all restaurants or hospitals or something, some organization that has been asked to implement. In site A, it's working extremely well. It's very successful. Everybody's doing it. Everybody loves doing it. It's wonderful success, success. Site B is a total failure. So what retroduction means is you start, like retroduction is like starting from the observable reality and then going back, underpinning that observable reality to understand what is the underpinning reason why that observable reality is manifesting in the way that it is. That's, that's what retroduction is. Retroduction is asking, why is this site successful? Why is this site not successful? It's not just reporting the data as, you know, just epidemiological data or descriptive epidemiology. It's asking the why question. And then when you unpack that why question, you might find a context mechanism interaction. In some cases, there's low morale. In some cases, there's a lack of uh, dissemination. There's maybe illiteracy. So people received the pamphlet, but they couldn't read it. So the retroductive question to serve to explain why there was a failure, tracing it back to the mechanism and or the, the lack of the mechanism. So that it doesn't have to always be in the positive. It's not always the mechanism gets triggered. So, you know, if in this case, you say the mechanism gets triggered as a realization of the need for hand washing. So if it doesn't get triggered because there is, a, in the context, a high level of illiteracy, that is retroduction. You are unpacking the reason why 
why is it happening? So that's a simple kind of trying to tie it back to the example to say about what retroduction is. So there's obviously much more to be said. Uh, you can read my latest article um, called Retroductive Theorizing in Paulson and Tilly's Applied Scientific Realism. Um, Vibhav, I can, I can send the article later. But the whole article is talking about retroduction. Yeah. Sure, sure. And I can share it with the participants for reading. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Prakriti okay. has another question for you uh, after that. Uh, she asks about uh, how uh, the quality assessment of full text uh, takes place while performing realist synthesis. Are there any criteria which uh, are used uh, or preferred? and are more amenable to realist synthesis approach? Or is it mainly guided by research questions or initial frameworks? Yes, you have, you have answered the question uh, to what, at the very end. I mean, mainly the quality, the decision about including papers in a realist synthesis has to do with how much relevance the paper has to your research questions, but even more importantly, your emerging program theories. So if you have an area of studying and you have some program theories you're seeking to test in the literature, you want to prioritize those papers that have the most correspondence to your program theories. And then secondarily, if there is some need to do some methodological appraisal, then you may do so. But there's a lot to be said uh, uh, about um, that. Ray Pawson wrote a very interesting article called Digging for Nuggets, How bad research can yield good evidence. And his thinking around it is that even some papers that may not have the highest standard in terms of methodological quality may still reveal some insights into the causal nature of programs. Some paper that has very rank low because it's poor methodology, but the authors have very clearly described the architecture of a program. That's what you need to be able to build your theoretical framework, so you might rank that paper as highly relevant, even though there is some issues there. These are all issues that do take some time to, 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 to really understand, but it's a very, very good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there are no more questions on the chat box right now, but I'll request participants uh, to either uh, put them on the chat box or you can directly ask the question to Dr. Justin. Uh, yeah, if, me, if, if people want to unmute their mics, it would be nice to have a verbal co communication. Uh, so even somebody who's already asked a question, you might want to have a follow-up or clarification. We have some time, a few, few minutes, seven minutes. Yeah, hi, Justin. Uh, Pragati here. Hi, Pragati. Uh, hi. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, sparing time. It was really insightful. So just taking a bit further on the... Uh, real synthesis because that's where I am right now. Yes, and, yes. Um, um, so the quality assessment, uh, as you said, I think now it gives me some confidence. Otherwise, while I was going through a lot of the criteria, um, they were heavily focused on um, the method uh, methodological rigor, and yes. uh, then, uh, but then they, it is not really explaining too much some of the full texts whereas uh, the others which had a lot of explanation a lot about context uh, didn't hold too good on the uh, criteria checklist so i think your response really helps me and gives me confidence to uh, um, navigate yes. it a bit yeah. yes and pragati you should read uh parson's um 2006 book evidence based policy a realist perspective where he does describe in detail, not a huge amount of detail, but some direction for understanding appraisal. And this will give you some more confidence. So everybody is struggling with this, but there is a very clear way that you can justify the inclusion of observational studies, qualitative studies, case studies um, in your retained set that may not be considered ranking high in a methodological ranking. Realists don't don't take that uh, don't take that uh, uh, take that up as important the the ranking of uh, studies in terms of randomized controlled trials on the top and uh, you know qualitative case studies on the bottom sort of we sort of lay it every sort of horizontally any paper might have might yield some insights that we can use to build our causal understanding uh, and this is very important when we're when we're dealing with complex problems 
um, that uh, often the irony is that those experimental papers, randomized controlled papers, often have the least amount of causal explanation. So they become the least useful for the realist synthesis. Not always, not always, but it has happened that this, this is the case. Um, so True. good, good. Yeah. True. Thanks. Thanks. And okay. just another observation as I was trying to see how um, through the prisma flow diagrams people um, explain uh, their uh, sort of uh, initiate, I mean, the starting and how they reach to their final set. And I found it surprising that uh, the huge cut downs after the step of removing duplicates um, is uh, really just an arrow that from say 500 we came down to 17. But then uh, how did you come down to that uh, is very less explained. And I found that a little strange that maybe that uh, segment of uh, explaining why and how you chose those articles uh, seemed quite lacking in several papers that I've been looking uh, of late. But yeah. yeah, I need to read a lot more. But good, good. You're, those, those, that way of thinking is very good. You have a mind to thinking about transparency in the decision making process, and that's absolutely critical. So I uh, have confidence in your thought process and why things are, because when you write your, you know, your your paper, you will be able to, you know, find the words to explain how it happened, where you ended up uh, with the set that you did. Um, uh, transparency is very, very, very important. That's a good comment. Yeah. Mina has another question. Uh, sorry, Mina, I, I missed that earlier. Thanks for writing it down again. Uh, what are the limitations of realist evaluation? Yeah, so um, of course, there are limitations to realist evaluation. Um, I mean, how can we like, I'm trying to find a way to say this succinctly. I mean, one limitation is that there is no clear path to doing a realist evaluation. So this is a sort of pragmatic um, limitation in the, in the sense that it does take time to gain capacity in retroductive thinking and to learn how to apply the approach. So when you go to the text, you read Pawson and Tilly, Ray Pawson, Nick Tilly's text, uh, and the other resources in realist evaluation and synthesis, it's not a recipe. It's not like a step-by-step -step guide. You have to off feel your way through it. Um, and then, then there's the question about program theories. How do you know your program theories are right? How do you know, how do you know that, uh, not that it's about right and wrong, but how do you know they are relevant? How, how do you know that you're sort of hitting on the most important aspects? Um, there's no easy answer. Uh, consultation with the literature, consultation with stakeholders, uh, working in a multidisciplinary team, developing rival theories. So that's also very important to, um, because you, do, you want to develop your theory driven approach, but to do it in an objective way so that you're not, um, you're not, you know, biasing your research. You are delving into the depths of your understanding of things, developing an objective frame. And some of that might be helped by rival theories. So in a theory where you say it could work this way, but alternatively, the same resource could backfire and create a completely different result. And so all of this takes time. So my, my main answer to the question is that the time factor to learn about realist methodology is, um, is you know, substantial and to give yourself enough time. I don't recommend somebody launching it and trying to complete a realist review within say six months, you know. So that's that's my general advice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks uh, everyone for the wonderful questions and thanks Dr. Justin for answering those questions. We have reached uh, our time and I assume now there are no more questions. Uh, uh, with your permission, I can share with your email ID with the participants if they have any more questions or they want to connect with you for further. Yes, uh, yeah. yes you can. You can.